Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this is our 62nd Coffee and Conversation. Uh, and for once, I guess I'm the speaker today. Uh, we have uh, actually two fascinating talks coming up uh, later on. On the 27th of September, Joss Marie Vanderspeck is going to be our speaker. Uh, Joss Marie was a young girl growing up in Holland during World War II during the Nazi occupation. And she'll talk about what it was like to be a, a young Dutch person there dealing with the Nazis and also being somewhat caught in the middle between, you know, you had the counterinsurgency crowd and uh, all of that going on. So it's really quite fascinating. I've heard her talk. And then on, a, well, certainly the 20th of September, we have Broomfield Days. So again, lots of fun out, you know, here in the parade. And then we'll have an open house, as usual, with refreshments uh, and some special exhibits of vehicles and command tent and other things out front. So a great thing to bring children and stuff as well. Uh, so please join us for that. And then on 11 September, Jerry Chesser is going to be our speaker. Jerry's our, our, yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah, October, uh, yeah, yeah, why, yeah, sure, this is a sharp audience today, well, anyway, J Jerry spent 20 years in the Navy and the submarine service, and that's an area we just know nothing about hardly, uh, but spent a bunch of time as a chief petty officer dealing with the nuclear power systems, uh, and has all sorts of stories to tell. Uh, a lot of them kind of funny things that happen, but, and I'm sure there's a lot he can't tell us as well. But uh, that'll be a, a great talk as well. Uh, just, uh, the 27th of September. So not next weekend, but the last one. Yeah, and that's September. So anyway, and that'll be a fascinating talk. So please, and she has a marvelous selection of slides and things to show as well. Uh, just quick reminder, you know, cell phones and, you know, we don't want to hear Beethoven's Fifth and other things as we're kind of going through here. Afterwards, uh, I'd also ask, you know, please come up and look at some of this stuff. Uh, just to highlight a few things. When we went off to Vietnam, this, this was, well, in the 70s, uh, and Tom was there much earlier, and several others of you, I'm sure, were there as well. I think Lee, did you, you there, or, yeah, Ed. Uh, and stuff. There wasn't a lot written about uh, Vietnam and that whole area. And most of us were told, well, a couple books to read were by Bernard Fall. Uh, and one was Street Without Joy, which basically talked about the French experience uh, with the Viet Minh, uh, you know, later became the NVA. Uh, but you could get a sensing of what was to come from the problems the French had. Uh, another excellent one by Bernard Fall was Hell in a Very Small Place, which basically was the set battle of Dien Bien Phu, which in many cases mirrored what we then experienced in Quezon, uh, which fortunately a little better result. Uh, two books that are really out in paperback, which I thought were excellent. Uh, one's called Chicken Hawk, uh, and it's basically the story of a Huey helicopter pilot during this whole period. And, and we always had a great deal of respect for what our helicopter pilots could do. But I, I was amazed listening to what these guys did uh, and the challenges you face trying to fly a helicopter, which basically tries to crash all the time, and you're trying to just keep it up. But these guys would l basically land them in very small little areas and basically chop their way through the trees to get down there to extract wounded soldiers and things. Uh, and I just found it amazing. Uh, Ripcord is another one, uh, which to me kind of has some personal things. It's the story about the battle for Hill 927 in the Asha Valley uh, by the 101st Airborne. Uh, and I have five classmates who were killed during the four months of fighting to retain that hill. Uh, and basically, one of the strategies was you plunk a a group of people out there sitting on top of a hill in a fire support base and let them be attacked. Uh, and then you pound the whole area with everything you have. Well, we tried it here for four months and then finally were forced to withdraw 
Uh, we just couldn't maintain the losses. Uh, but again, this, I thought, was an excellent book in showing you kind of the challenges of fighting in, in a jungle-type environment. Uh, the Damned Engineers was one all engineers had to read because this was actually World War II. But it's a story of the 297th Engineers, which basically were detailed to strictly do road maintenance uh, and run a, a sawmill in the area just kind of uh, up, oh, near Hoofalese, uh, near St. Vith. And when the Battle of the Bulge started, these guys dropped everything, grabbed their weapons, uh, mines, explosives, and everything, and basically fought a delaying action in the northern area and very much frustrated Piper and the Panzer Group, which was trying to get to the bridges uh, along, you know, up toward uh, Belgium, well, Holland and stuff. Uh, and basically the name came from uh, a swearing Piper did when they blew the final bridge, which basically stopped this whole advance. Uh, but it was kind of fascinating looking at what engineers have kind of done. Uh, I got a little kind of our, you know, you've cruise manuals, you have all this other stuff. Well, in the Army, we kind of sometimes put together a, uh, just a little book uh, telling your story. So this was the 25th Infantry Division one, and with the 65th Engineers who I, I was part of. Uh, this a little bit later we'll talk about. This is an example of the resourcefulness of the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong to use things and throw it back at us. This basically is an early stage of an IED, imp improvised explosive, that we frequently ran into on trails, roads, anything else. What was it made of? Not anything fancy. A Dud 105 round. You removed the fuse from it, hooked it up with some batteries. Uh, interestingly, the rubber that pulls it together uh, stripped off from plastic bags and rubber bags, which we often use to kind of protect our weapons, keep them out of the mud. Uh, the contacts, in many cases, cut up pieces of sea ration cans. We threw them away all the time. Again, the ends are tied together with strips of rubber, which we provided because we just abandoned it in the field. You bury this on a trail or in the road, put your 105 round off to the side, you come along, you close the contact, and bang. Uh, we lost uh, a certain number of vehicles and heavy equipment due to these things. Uh, and when we often did mine sweeping uh, on roads, which we had to do constantly, uh, they'd police up uh, these little connector links. These are connector links that went to 50 caliber rounds or smaller ones which went to M60. There are millions of them. All of South Vietnam is just loaded with this stuff. You police them up, you bury these in the trail along with the little contact. We come along with our minesweepers, you know, which are, you're wearing these earphones and stuff and you hear a little beat whenever it detects metal. You stop, you get down, you probe. What do you find? These. And sooner or later, after about an hour and a half of doing that, you're your hearing's gone, your brain's kind of elsewhere, and you miss this. Uh, but again, nothing <coughs> really sophisticated, nothing made in a factory. Uh, you just kind of police it up. So anyway, let me kind of get going. Uh, I served 25 years in the Army. Uh, I'm amazed it went why so quickly. Uh, just as a quick summary, maybe hard to see, uh, grew up in a career Navy family but I ended up in the Army, that's interesting. Ended up going to West Point, very fortunate for that. Great school, really wanted to go to Annapolis, but that's another story. Uh, ended up selecting Corps of Engineers as my branch of service. Uh, went to a whole bunch of specialty training as we all did as young, gung-ho Army guys. Uh, went off to Ranger School, marvelous. Airborne School, Jungle Warfare School. Not to mention demolitions and all the rest of it. Uh, I married into a career army family. Probably the best thing I ever did. Uh, and you'll see. Uh, I served really with kind of three engineer units. 
Uh, my first one was the 77th Engineer Company, and we'll talk about that. 65th Engineer Battalion, that was in Vietnam. 317th Engineer Battalion in Germany. Uh, and then from there, the 5th Corps Engineer Staff, which basically did all the engineer planning for 5th Corps. Uh, I was very fortunate with some special assignments. Uh, and that probably as much kept me in the Army for many years as anything. Uh, I had a chance to go back to West Point twice to teach. Uh, first time physics, and then second time nuclear engineering, and actually be the executive officer for the engineering department. Uh, I had an assignment with the Defense Nuclear Agency, never even knew it existed. Uh, and that was quite interesting. We were developing large pulse X-ray machines to test full-scale missile and satellite systems. Uh, and then finally, my last assignment was with the headquarters for the Corps Engineers, uh, which was the Military Programs Directorate, which managed all the military construction the Corps did, to include the buildup in uh, Kuwait for the first Gulf War, and then eventually took over the Environmental Restoration Division for the Corps. But anyway, just talking about kind of growing up here and what influenced me, uh, I'd say my father. I thought the, the, you know, he, it was really quite something. Uh, but career Navy officer, uh, served 30 years. Uh, during World War II in the Pacific, Pacific he commanded destroyers, uh, two of them, uh, which ultimately both were sunk in the fighting out there. First one, the, the Gwyn, in one of the later battles uh, in the Solomon Islands, which were brutal for the Navy. Uh, brought another destroyer out which participated in Iwo Jima, uh, up through Leyte, turned command over just as uh, Okinawa started, um, and that ship was sunk by kamikazes. So I was kind of lucky with that. Uh, and then finally, he was through the Cold War, commanded a, a tanker, and then eventually uh, headed the MSTS, which was the Mediterranean Shipping. Uh, in the Mediterranean, and there, then we lived in, in Europe, uh, in Italy, actually. And the thing I can kind of remember growing up in the Navy was, again, always being around ships, the smell of ships, the impressiveness of them. Uh, and then when we were in Italy, every time a ship came into Livorno, which is where we lived, we would have the, the CO, the commander, and typically the exec over for dinner. And I can just always remember sitting around the table, I was you know, young kid then, and just looking at these guys, and kind of gray-haired, you know, always well-tanned, wrinkled, and, you know, just khaki dress, and then listening to them tell stories. And, and a lot of them were funny stories, you know, when they were young, back lieutenants and stuff, and all things going on. And, and yeah, I just thought that was the coolest thing. Uh, this also, for us in high school, for many, this was the early 60s. This was a tumultuous time, and I think that changed us in many respects. Uh, you had the continuing communist threat in Europe, you know, in Germany, and all of that going on. You had the missile gap, you know, communist Cuba. We had the, you know, the big embargo, you know, when we discovered missiles there. Uh, you had a lot of turmoil in our own country. You know, the civil rights movement, freedom riders, you had riots, all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, you had a growing impact of television. Uh, it was quite a while before we had a television, but by the 60s, we kind of did. You know, and every night, you saw everything coming right into your home, you know, particularly the Freedom Riders and everything going on. Uh, and I, that really, I think, influenced very much our, our country's attitude toward the Vietnam War later on. Uh, John F. Kennedy, I think everyone was excited with that. And particularly, I think, for many of us in the senior year in high school and things, you know, his famous speech in which he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, I think motivated many of us to look at, you know, just the Peace Corps, all sorts of things. And back then, you know, growing up, I'd say almost every family had someone who had been in the service, knew someone was in the <coughs> service, you know, and we also had the draft still going on then. Uh, so, you know, you had a pretty good chance of, you know, ending up in the service one way or the other. Uh, and this was also the first time we started hearing a little bit about 
Vietnam and what seemed to be going on in Asia. You know, up until this time, most of everything we all thought about was kind of Europe. Uh, so anyway, I graduated from high school in, in 1964. My father kind of said, son, you're probably not going to get into Annapolis because your eyes and stuff like that. You know, why not think of another military college? Uh, well, it just so happened that in 64, uh, West Point was finally receiving authorization to increase their enrollment to match Navy and Air Force. Navy and Air Force for years have had 3,200 or I think close to 4,000 as their authorized limit. Uh, Army was still at 2,200. So lo and behold, come 1964, they were scrambling to fill up a bunch of extra slots. And, and I had no problems academically or physical and all that stuff. But, you know, they would come to the eye test, you know, and they'd look seriously at me, you know, and say, hmm, hmm. You know, and then finally one of the doctors said, do you really want to go to West Point? And I said, yes, sir. Yeah, I knew what to answer. And I said, okay, chunk. And their guidance always was, well, bring some extra glasses with you and stay near your sergeant, and you'll be all right. <laughs> so I always carried extra glasses, I'll tell you. And, uh, and yeah, you know, you kind of stayed near your sergeant and stuff for all sorts of reasons. So anyway, uh, I found it challenging. Uh, great education, small classes, uh, great examples of leadership. All our instructors were military. And most of them at that time had served maybe one or more tours in Vietnam. Uh, we could always talk about anything that was going on. Uh, even I had uh, Major Schwarzkopf to teach me thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. And there are a bunch of others who later on became general officers and things that you can kind of look back. Uh, and, you know, well, during the summer months, you know, all our classmates from high school were off having fun. We were always sent off for training and stuff. Uh, but actually, you know, when you're young, you know, you're looking for challenges. It, it really was kind of a lot of fun. Uh, well, something happened which really changed my life. Uh, in the summer of 1966, I was sent down to Fort Hood, Texas for training. Uh, that's the last place I wanted to go. We could always ask for where we wanted to go for training. And I had Europe, Alaska, South America, anything. Well, Fort Hood, Texas, you know. Uh, and I was assigned to an engineer battalion and stuff, and they tolerated us, you know, running around. We weren't lieutenants yet, you know, but we were fresh, you know, trying to learn things and not act too dumb. Well, I was in the officer's club one afternoon, just having a beer, nothing much going on. And my roommate waltzed in, not waltz, but came in, and said he had a date with the colonel's daughter, but he needed someone to take out the younger daughter. <laughs> so I said, OK, yeah, I have not, nothing going on. Now, I was in shorts and a t-shirt. You know, it said West Point, so it wasn't you know, too bad. And we trudled over to a, the colonel's house, lovely family, liked them right off the bat and, and stuff. And lo and behold, it was Becky, Rebecca, who was uh, my date. Well, boy, I was blown away. Very sharp, she just graduated from high school, getting ready to go off to college, kind of knew what she wanted to do in life, uh, was used to moving around, you know, and stuff. Uh, looked pretty good to me. <laughs> uh, but I didn't think I'd ever see her again. You know, she's in Fort Hood, Texas. I got to go back to West Point, you know, and who knows. Well, lo and behold, that September, I got a postcard in the mail from Becky saying, hey, remember me? Uh, my father just got transferred from his brigade command to an assignment with the UN in New York City. And we're going to be living at Fort Totten. You know, why not come down and see me sometime, kind of you know, thing. Uh, and so lo and behold, we got hooked up again, you know, and, uh, you know, the rest is kind of history. It was kind of the best thing I ever did. Uh, come senior, year first season, we call it, uh, you get a chance to sh choose what branch you're going to go to. And that's all dependent kind of on your class standing and everything. 
and I was pretty high up. Uh, and so I could pick infantry, armor, artillery, engineer, signal, or a few others that were there. Uh, granted, infantry, armor, artillery, they're kind of the hot shot things, you know, that there's always pressure, you go for them. And typically the first highest cadets always pick infantry and stuff. And then the lowest cadets, the last, get ranked infantry. Uh, well, I, I always enjoyed engineering. I like building things uh, and stuff. And the engineers seem to look pretty good for me. Um, they have a strong support to send people back to graduate school, get professional engineer licensing and stuff. I said, hmm, that sounds good. Uh, there are a variety of technical assignments you could do. You didn't always have to be out pounding the boonies. Uh, and, but you still get to do the close combat support stuff, which I thought was kind of cool too. So I went ahead and picked engineers. <coughs> so from then on, you know, life really picked up, got pretty busy. Uh, we had 60 days of graduation leave uh, and had a marvelous time there. Actually, what happened is I went, we were living in Massachusetts at the time, and I went off and bought this old rickety sloop. It was wooden, and it leaked like a sieve. But after a week, it kind of closed up, and two classmates and I just loaded gear on, and we sailed up along the main coast and stuff. And I had a great time. Uh, but after that, off to ranger school at Fort Benning, uh, and that was pretty strenuous. Uh, and from that, we went to the engineer officer basic course and a lot to learn as a young engineer in terms of construction and doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, but we probably were an obnoxious crowd because whenever they came to field exercises, those of us who had already done ranger school, psh, this is nothing. You know, and whereas everyone else kind of thought this was kind of big stuff to us, it was a breeze. Uh, then airborne school and then our first assignment. And I picked the 77th Engineer Company, Port Construction. It sounded interesting. Port Construction companies, you know, have tremendous capabilities. I mean, they have diving units with them. They have barge sets that you can build barges. They have all sorts of cranes. You have this big kit of big, these steel cubes that you can build barges and stuff. Uh, and at that time, several port construction companies were over in Vietnam just working like heck to build the port facilities we needed. Well, and this was also in the DC areas at Fort Belvoir. Well, Becky was doing hospital work in Washington, DC then. So that kind of influenced me a little bit too. Uh, but I learned a lot. I had to be an equipment <coughs> platoon leader and then became XO for the company. Uh, and it also first exposed me to the problems that command can have. Uh, that company was a wreck. Uh, it ended up being, well, one, the company commander at the time we joined him was kind of a senior guy who was more interested in, in a hot dog stand. He was operating a wo along Route 1 than the company. Mm -hmm. So we kind of floundered. He didn't get along with the battalion commander. So the battalion commander all the time looked for ways to criticize the company, which normally meant we were caught in the middle. Uh, but at the same point, which I learned very on, the change of command, bringing in some fresh leadership and stuff can turn things around. And eventually he left, a new young captain came in, uh, and things changed overnight. We changed some of the, you know, you know, platoon leader positions. I moved up to XO. And within a couple months, you wouldn't have recognized the company. Uh, and that kind of... I saw that forever in the Army. Uh, key leadership and leadership positions can change everything. But anyway, uh, that was quite a good experience. At that point, I also met someone, George Usinowich. George joined the company as a young second lieutenant. I was a first lieutenant at the time. George was kind of a wild guy, uh, but very sharp. Uh, we got along just fine. Uh, you know, we kind of developed the friendship. And that friendship has continued through today. Uh, that's a picture of George and me. George now lives in Durango. Uh, and I was kind of hoping, I've been trying to get him to come up, because the talk I wanted to give, wanted to have George here. 
and me because he would give the perspective of what it was like to be a second lieutenant that and I was his company commander <laughs> but that comes later but we had, we had a good time you know nothing's like being a young lieutenant at unmarried at the time uh, we had a lot of fun uh, and then the most important event occurred Becky finally agreed that yes we'll get married and we got married at Carlisle Barracks, which was the Army War College. And I hadn't kind of mentioned it, but her father now was a Brigadier General uh, and was the Assistant Commandant at the college, but a marvelous gentleman uh, and stuff. Thoroughly, you know, just enjoyed him. Uh, so anyway, that happened. And then we had a year kind of together, and I knew we were going to end up going to Vietnam. So I got, finally got my orders in the spring of 1970. Uh, I didn't know where I was going at the time. You know, the orders you get says show up at whatever the air base is just north of San Francisco on such and such a date, you know, we'll take care of you from there. So, you know, I kind of traveled, we traveled in khakis, uh, had one duffel bag, you know, and I can remember saying goodbye to my mother, and she was in tears and everything and stuff. My father was stoic and said, go do it, son. You know, <laughs> it's your responsibility, you know, and all that good stuff. And, uh, you know, I can remember getting on a plane, uh, lots of people kind of looking at you, flew out to San Francisco, uh, walking around the airport kind of looking lost, but there were Army guys running around their duty was to police up us souls, you know, and ran us out, dumped us on a bus, drove us up to Travis, I think it was. Yeah. 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 And then sat around there what seemed like forever, and then they finally said, okay, fellows and 200 other lucky guys, get on that plane, you know, so we kind of loaded up. Uh, it was, you know, a contract plane. Uh, I thought the stewardess were very nice because they kind of knew where we were heading. Uh, and we had a long flight. I think we stopped in Alaska, uh, Japan, maybe, Tokyo, Tokyo yeah. And then finally, I remember landing uh, at Benoit, a long bed, I guess, or, but the air base Benoit, late at night, uh, dead tired, all of us stumbling out of the plane, lights all around. And, and I just remember the smell and the heat just hit you, just flat out. You, you know, you knew you weren't in Kansas. Uh, and especially a lot of guys running around with weapons and stuff all over the place. Well, they kind of moved us all into this big hall. And it's kind of blurry, but some things you remember. Lots of noise, guys on tables, you know, and we had to kind of go through uh, some line some guy looked at our orders, looked up at you and said, oh, you, go out that door. So if you're going to go up to play coup or something like that, you went out there, they load you on a C-130 and you go off that direction. You go. So we all were kind of going in different directions. And then I just kind of vaguely remember someone said, oh, fellows, go out that door. You're going to the 25th Infantry Division. Okay. You know, so we trudle on out there. And actually, I knew something. Beck's father was the assistant commander uh, of the 25th Infantry Division. But that was the first inkling I had something's up. Uh, so anyway, they flew us up to Coochie. Uh, God, I don't, probably one o'clock at night or something. So I got off, a young guy met me from the 65th Engineer Battalion, and he said, I said, okay, let's go. And he said, no, 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 you gotta go over here first. So lo and behold, drags me into the division headquarters, you know, and I'm sitting around there, and next thing I know, well, the other thing was I turned captain just then. So I pinned on my captain's bars. Yeah, I wasn't going to show up as a first lieutenant. <laughs> uh, and, the, and, and some officer came out and said, take those captain bars off. You know, I said, what? I'm a captain. You know, he said, take them off. And so, okay, trudled into the room, and lo and behold, my father-in-law was there, General Green. <laughs> and so he pinned my captain bars on me. <laughs> and that was just a nice touch. 
and then was off to the battalion. Uh, command, well, oh, okay, we'll, well, we'll get into that. But let me talk a little bit about Kuchi and, and kind of Vietnam and all that stuff as well. Uh, this may be a little hard to see, uh, but you know, particularly comparing our experience in Korea to Vietnam to what we've, or Iraq and Afghanistan, there are some distinct differences in stuff. Uh, Vietnam, you know, a long coastline here, almost 2,000 miles, uh, and a whole border here, uh, Laos, Cambodia, all along this area. Central Highlands, Ho Chi Minh City, which was Saigon. Ku Chi was right at kind of up in, in this area toward the Parrot's Beak. Uh, looking at kind of the layout of the land, and we'll see this because I have some pictures. Uh, the whole area along the coastline is called the coastal low line, lowlands. It's basically a sand uh, area. Uh, very few areas that could be useful for a major port. No development at all. Uh, quite challenging to build in. But this is the area where the majority of the population lives. Because again, it, it being flat, uh, easy to farm, you know, fairly fertile. Uh, the next area up here, which is kind of where most, where we kind of operate, is what you call the highlands. Uh, that goes almost to an area, I won't call it like Colorado, but generally a combination, drier areas, kind of mainly flat, uh, these are areas where the massive uh, old rubber plantations from the French still existing. And you can have areas which will be quite open, a lot of rice paddies, and then a, a very big jungle kind of area, very dense. Uh, and again, a lot of population lives through that area. Uh, this plateau, which is kind of the highlands area, uh, a massive jungle, uh, tall hills. Uh, a very debt area that the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, always controlled. Uh, it was kind of up in that area where we fought, the 101st fought for Hill 920, 927, uh, which basically uh, uh, was Asha Valley all up through there. Just a, a, a tough area to be in. What altitudes were these at? Oh, not, not great. Uh, 3,000 feet at a max. Uh, but the th problem is no roads or anything. The only way you can get into that area and move around is by helicopter. And then come the wet season, you can't fly in there because the ceiling's so low. So what typically might happen <coughs> is we might move up into that area, plop in a fire support base, create a lot of havoc, but come the monsoon season, winter, we'd withdraw because you couldn't resupply it. And then finally, the delta area, uh, very wet, swampy, uh, main way of getting around uh, often would be riverine craft, landing craft, and certainly helicopters. Uh, but not a lot of roads. Uh, and what roads are were kind of pretty small. Where's Monkey Mountain in that area? Oh, Monkey Mountain. Big radar installation. Well, uh, uh, n well uh, up near Tain Inn, uh, is a famous kind of mountain uh, area we call Nui Baden. Uh, and you just have a main flat areas and then just in the middle of anything there's this tall mountain. And generally throughout the area, everywhere there is a tall mountain area, uh, we would normally have uh, something up there. Uh, and typically it would be a radio relay station. Uh, but then you definitely have to reinforce it because the you know, Viet Minh or Viet Cong and North Vietnamese would always try and take it from you. Uh, and smaller ones, you often might put a fire support base for artillery on it. And you guys would build that stuff. Yeah, that's kind of one of our missions. Uh, and then just finally here, it's hard to see, uh, but one of the big challenges was just uh, the infrastructure. When we first moved into, you know, South Vietnam, there essentially was very little infrastructure. There was kind of the main road which ran up along the coastline here, uh, two lane, in many cases not paved. Uh, most of the roads going into the network here, uh, if they exist at all, were strictly, uh, uh, you know, dirt, some gravel and things like that. One of the major 
you know, the first five years uh, of a lot of the work done by engineers. And, well, let's see, where's, you know, oh, was to just try and put in the basic infrastructure that we were going to need here. Uh, if you looked at for ports and stuff, the basic only port that was anything significant was Saigon on the Mekong you know, River. Uh, we had to move in. There were some promising areas. There were some areas, particularly Vong Tau, uh, Cameron Bay, uh, all up toward kind of Da Nang and things, where the, you know, the geography was conducive for a port of things, but nothing was there. So you basically had to move in and build it right from scratch. Uh, no quarries to speak of in the area for gravel and everything, which was critical to your needs. No cement factories, nothing. We kind of had to bring it all uh, and eventually develop things ourselves. By the 1970s, which is the time I got there, we had put in a tremendous amount of effort on infrastructure and particularly roads, which really did a lot to help improve the life and the economy uh, for villagers and things. And this kind of, the little map back here kind of reflects uh, the major road network that by then uh, had been put in place, much of it uh, paved, uh, could support the movement of armored tracks and things like that. Uh, but you always still had problems with interdictions, occasionally ambushes in areas and, and bridges getting blown. And of course, you know, what made this really difficult here is this whole area down along the border uh, you know, it was essentially the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, and what essentially we had during this period, you know, as the Korean War was brutal also. But basically after about the first six months, uh, the war was manned and staffed by, a cent you know, Chinese. <coughs> and it was more of a conventional thing that we could bring in the total, total capabilities uh, of our military, particularly armor, Ar well, artillery and uh, uh, air. Uh, in Vietnam, the, throughout the whole war, the main resource of manpower came from the North Vietnamese. Uh, because very quickly, the Viet Minh and uh, Viet Cong down that area were taken over. The Russians provided all the resources. Uh, no, they didn't have to spend anything in terms of manpower. But everything that we shot up destroyed from the North Vietnamese, uh, the Russians just replaced and did it all the way up to the tail end. Uh, so you still had to kind of, you know, recognize, you know, the stamina of the North Vietnamese to just keep coming. Uh, but they, toward the end, there was no shortage of equipment for anything. And that was all their people, all the North Vietnamese? Importing. No, no Chinese, no Russians. Uh, they were there. And actually what's interesting is you go back and you look at the history of Vietnam, we probably should have realized you're going to be in for a battle. I mean the history, the Vietnamese right from the first records of things were always fighters and they fought themselves between themselves, between the north, central, and south. Uh, Chinese came in several times to try and conquer the area and got beaten and driven off uh, all the way up, you know, through the latest. Well, anyway, when I first got there, uh, I first was assigned to the S-1 to be the S-1. Uh, no one wants to be an S-1. You know, the glory is in being an S-3, an operations guy or something. But that's all they had available, and no companies were available. Yeah, admin, personnel. Uh, but actually, it wasn't bad. Uh, I learned a lot, you know, as an S1, I got a chance to go around and, and meet all the other company commanders and stuff and uh, up and lower and things. And this was my little group. And actually, I was always very impressed with our soldiers. These guys, probably the oldest was 19. Uh, about half of them had had maybe a year or two of college and then for what reason dropped out. The rest were drafted. Uh, but a night, and none had ever been away from home, much less, you know, halfway across the world. But a group, <coughs> a good group of guys, 
you know, who kind of wanted to do the best they could, uh, had plans for the future. Uh, and it was very easy to kind of just sit down with them and ask them kind of what's going on. You got their whole history and everything. Uh, but it was a good group. Uh, also, at least living on, on Kuchi, uh, life was pretty good. This was 1970. The first guys who came there in about 63 were living in tents for a long time. Well, by now, this was a huge, this is like a small city. We had our own little airfield, uh, lots of nice hooch buildings here. And that was my hooch that I shared with uh, uh, Ken Chung, who was our S4 uh, fun guy. Uh, and it was kind of fun. Uh, at night, we would kind of come in. You have all your... Uh, your web gear and everything always ready to go. But our little hooch kind of was shaped like an L inside. And the first thing Ken would do would be to take his little can of DDT, stick it underneath his cot and go whoosh. And then you'd hear tsh -tsh -tsh. <laughs> <laughs> And they'd all come racing around to my side of the hooch. And so I'd take my can of DDT, go whoosh, And they'd go whoosh back the other side. And then after about two or three sessions, things quieted down, you know, and you kind of scooped them out. But, you know, you couldn't keep, I mean, these were big things. Uh, but, you know, you just kind of get used to that after a while. Uh, breathing a lot of that DDT probably wasn't too good, but, you know, that was the least of our worries. Well, lo and behold, one of my duties as S1 is our battalion commander forced T. Gay, uh, great guy. I think long history, probably Southern cause or something. It just seemed that way. But he had worked this deal where he could send his S-1 down to Saigon to look at lists of incoming officers. And if they were engineer, he got to have a pick. So I got to go down there every now and then, uh, which was interesting. Saigon's quite a place. In fact, interesting. My wife and her family lived there in the early 60s uh, as part of the you know, early support element. So she knew Saigon and had contacts there and everything. So I'd look them up. But anyway, I went down there one time, and lo and behold, on the listing of incoming officers was George Ucinowich. Uh So I said, I want him. Uh, George had no idea this and probably had great plans to go up north to a port construction company. So I made sure when the helicopter finally landed and the guys got off the helicopter, I was there to greet him. Hi, George. Remember? And, and talk about a surprise. But anyway, so, yep, he, we were back together. Had, you know, we were both busy doing different things. Uh, he was a, a lieutenant now signed out to one of the companies. Uh, so anyway, uh, he got there. I finally had my chance to get a command after about four months there. Uh, I took over B Company uh, of the 65th and given the choice of picking some of my lieutenants. So I picked George for the B2nd platoon. And actually the battalion commander said, no, 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 you want these other guys. I said, no, I want George. Uh, but I had a great group of lieutenants. Uh, and we still keep in touch, some of us. Uh, so I took command of B Company. Uh, and lo and behold, as soon as we got kind of organized there, uh, we learned that 25th Infantry Division's going home as part of the Vietnamization effort. Well, they weren't all going home. Uh, they were leaving 2nd Brigade of the 25th, which was now moving from the Kuchi area, which was northwest of Saigon, down to Swan Lock, which was down in the Delta kind of area, uh, down toward Vong Tau and stuff. So lo and behold, they need an engineer company, and we were that engineer company. Uh, so we were renamed the 54th Engineer Company uh, and moved with them as they moved down the Swan Lock area. Now just talking a little bit about, uh, one thing shows an engineer company where the 54th about 130 personnel organized into, you might say, four platoons kind of structure, a headquarters platoon, which basically included a combo section, a maintenance section, even a little mess section, uh, 
kind of our, our maintenance and heavy equipment were all kind of part of that. And that basically stayed back at our base camp. And then we had three platoons, line platoons, uh, typically 30, 35 men, headed by a, typically a second lieutenant. Uh, oh, I had my XO, which was Kent Gonzer, who was a first lieutenant. And we were in support of 2nd Brigade, 25th Infantry. Now, this brigade is composed of three battalions, often called regiments, uh, and these were mechanized. These guys rode around in vehicles, APCs. We rode around in five-ton dump trucks. <laughs> uh, and, of course, they had uh, artillery, uh, battery, or um, even kind of reinforced. So typically what happens, you kind of develop a kind of direct relationship between your platoons with each uh, battalion. So basically you have a platoon supporting a battalion of infantry uh, and stuff. And that's what kind of being a company commander a little frustrating because I want to get out there and lead troops. You know, I want to get out there and do stuff. Well, the platoon leaders are the ones who kind of had a lot of the fun. They got out there and did all that stuff. My role, for the most part, was to deal with the battalion commanders, the other staff, to kind of figure out and tell them how best to use us engineers. You know, don't throw us out there as perimeter guards. We can do a lot for you. Uh, so I kind of was always busy kind of running around to different group areas, talking to battalion staff and all that thing, uh, to kind of figure out what we needed to do and kind of help them. Salesman, yeah, it's kind of that. Uh, looking at engineer equipment we typically would have, uh, and again, this is not a mech unit. We're, we're a straight leg unit, kind of. Uh, at a platoon level, you would have a jeep, one jeep, uh, which would be the platoon leader's jeep, typically a deuce and a half, two and a half ton truck for lugging stuff around. And then each squad had a five ton dump truck. That's what the squad rode around in. Uh, unless we could hook a ride on an APC or, you know, flying out in helicopters. You load everything into your good old faithful dump truck. Uh, typically assigned, we'd have a D7 dozer with low bed trailer and a bucket loader, although many times we would kind of keep them as part of our equipment platoon section versus putting it out there with them. Uh, each squad then had Pioneer toolkit and demolition kits. Pioneer Toolkit's just a big box about the size of that, which has shovels, picks, all the same stuff an engineer probably had, you know, for the Revolutionary War. <laughs> uh, and it hadn't advanced a lot. Although we did have chainsaws and, and a lot of stuff like that. And then we had demolition kits and mine detector kits and all that kind of stuff. So we could blow up anything. Uh, Kind of at the company level then, we had a couple quarter ton Jeeps, because I had one, XO had one. We placed up a few others, you know, along the way. We had deuce and a half. We had a couple five ton dump trucks, which we shouldn't have had, but, you know, if they're kind of laying around there and no one's using them, we'd kind of take them over. Uh, we had another D7 dozer. We had a couple small dozers that you could actually pick up and transport by helicopter. Uh, if you were going to do some work on top of a hill. Uh, I think we had an extra bucket loader. We had a 10, 20 ton crane uh, that the battalion left us, and they were useful. Uh, we had some road graders, and lo and behold, even two water purification kits. These were on, mounted on a big truck. We're not very useful. Uh, you basically would go out there with this truck, put a big portable kind of tank out there, uh, pump water from God knows what, threw some filters into it, put a bunch of chemicals in it, flock, flocculate it, uh, drain that off, throw in a bunch of other stuff that would kill most everything, and voila, you have awful tasting water. <laughs> but it won't make you sick. But the problem is, you put something like that out next to a stream for 24 hours, you're just asking it to be shot up. So. We didn't do this very often. We did it sometimes by going as part of a, uh, an effort to help a small village and set that up. But what the heck? You give them kind of clean water that tastes funny. 
you know, in 24 hours or 36 hours, you're gone. The other thing I found interesting there is I couldn't get up-to-date chemicals for it. Everything that they, the Army supply system had expired probably five years ago. <laughs> uh, and you just couldn't for life you get it. Now we still have these units, but now they're reverse osmosis. They're pretty fancy and stuff. Uh, OK, so what did we do during that period? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say this is by priority. Yeah, it's probably pretty close to it. Uh, fire su support base construction. And I'll show some pictures of what that is. Uh, anytime you go out you know, in a big operation, you want your artillery with you. But you need to put them in a little protective you know, enclosure. So we'd go out and build that for them. Did a lot of mine sweeping uh, every day. Uh, if you build a fire support base, you need a little pad to land helicopters, you know, so it would keep the dust down and stuff like that. Uh, road maintenance, temporary road construction. You want to go off any main road, you've got to build a road. Uh, and lo and behold, it'll be dusty as heck in the summer, and it'll be one horrendous mud pile, you know, once the monsoons start. Uh, Ford and bridge construction, you know, streams and stuff everywhere. Uh, and during dry season, they're dry. During monsoon season, they're a raging river. And they're perfect sites for ambushes, you know, mines and everything. Uh, we did supported land clearing, and I'll show you some pictures of that. We didn't have, these were big D9 dozers with special blades that could level a forest, and we did, a lot of them. Uh, and then combat air assault, we did some of that. And then when we weren't doing all the above, we were doing infrastructure support. So we were busy. Uh, in fact, you know, as long as the men were very busy, you, know, you never had problems. The issue was when they came back to the, the base for a while and stuff, you're exhausted and things. And then you just kind of kind of keep track of what's going on in the barracks. Uh, uh, we'll come back to that later. Uh, let me show you some pictures of stuff. And I have to admit, I owe a lot of the uh, -da, pictures uh, to George. Uh, I, was, I thought I was going to be real smart in that I bought a small little camera that I could carry in a first aid pouch. You know, it always seemed hokey to me to have these guys running around with these big 35 millimeter cameras, you know, in, in the middle of a war. So I had this little camera, and that was great. Then I realized a little too late, the pictures come out like this. And then, uh, then the slides come out even smaller. So I'm kind of trying to figure out how to blow them up so I can at least see what the heck we did. Uh, we'll just quickly go through a lot of this. This, uh, well, this shows just an example of kind of a typical berm area in a fire support base. These are kind of fighting positions. Uh, which generally we brought metal culverts, which make these nice little half round things. You slip in, into place into this thing, load it with sandbags, a uh, bunch of barbed wire up here, and out in front, uh, various demolitions. This is probably a little better picture. Uh, again, even though you have a tent here where you may work above ground and stuff, this is where you go when the mortar rounds start flying in. Uh, this is dug down probably about six feet. Here's kind of a little entrance. That really is a, uh, my mind just went blank. What did I call it earlier? Culvert. culvert. Yeah. And we put in a lot of culverts. <laughs> but again, probably more culvert material was used for bunker type things than that than we ever even put in. I mean, we're popular. We were the culvert people. Uh, <laughs> We could trade culvert material for anything. Uh, but again, you know, sandbags all around. Uh, any place you sit around for more than you know, a couple, I'd say a week, you expect to be mortared. Uh, this shows a little uh, adjacent little f a landing pad. Uh, basically, we level it off, kind of pound it down a bit, and sprayed it with uh, stuff called Penaprime. Uh, it's kind of a, a tar, thicker kind of base. Uh, smelled horrible, uh, but it dried pretty fast and really kept the dust down. 
Uh, we didn't have these things. Construction battalions did. Marvelous. Boy, you need to move dirt. Uh, these big scrapers with plows on the front. Uh, but we ran across them every now and then. This is what we dealt with in many cases. And this, this is the easy stuff. This is a rubber plantation. Uh, started by the French probably the late 1800s, ni early 1900s. This is what the Japanese were after in World War II. Oh, thought that was me. Uh, nice trees planted in nice rows go on forever. Uh, people could be hiding back between any of these things here and you wouldn't really see it. But nice open fields of fire. Someone could be 200 yards down a row of that thing with a sniper rifle and pick you off as you're kind of going down the road here because you have nice complete fields of fire on that thing. They'll always cause some problems. Uh, this picture just kind of shows uh, uh, something we had to do every day in the infantry very much so. This was just an area set up where you cleaned your weapon. Uh, M16 is a nice weapon, but you get a little dust, you get a little dirt in it, you fire it, and it's going to jam on you. Uh, later ones did better. Early ones, shoot, some guys got rid of them and used the AK-47. Uh, uh, but anyway, you're forever cleaning stuff. Ah, there's our, there's our vehicle, uh, five-ton dump trucks. Loved them. Uh, not exactly what you want to ride around in all day long, but boy, we use them for everything. Uh, this is kind of a, your sensors always go up every time you came to an area like this. It's a little Ford. Obviously, people have been through it before. Uh, the areas around here, the, the soil's all been chewed up. A perfect place to put in a, a mine. Uh, perfect area to have an ambush. Uh, so every time you approach anything like that, uh, if you hadn't been there before or whatever, you get out, you spread out, you kind of approach it gingerly, uh, and then you kind of cross it. And lo and behold, now and then, you're going to miss something. Uh, and that was a deuce and a half which ran across a mine kind of like that. And fortunately, uh, there's our, the driver, uh, no in injury to him. Uh, but that was not uncommon uh, for when we kind of were out. Uh, well, just a shot of a bunch of water buffaloes. You know, in certain areas, the roads are pretty restricted. You know, you have rice paddies on either side. During the dry months, they're dry. You can kind of get around. But once it begins to rain, uh, you know, water will kind of be up to here. Uh, example of kind of a defensive kind of thing we put out. You can kind of see this is, again, the wire. This is outside defense. The berms here, uh, these are Claymore mines. Uh, they're mines we used, kind of a curved shape, packed with explosives and 600 ball bearings. Very nasty. Uh, but you could pl place these out here. And we put sandbags behind it to lessen the back blast. Uh, and this is faced outward. And then you have wires coming back. So if you're under a attack uh, and stuff, you can trigger them off, and it just basically, you know, wipes out everything out to about 50, 75 yards in front of you. Uh, use them all the time for defensive positions. Uh, a lot of times we'd go out on on by squad size and smaller uh, operations, and helicopters would fly in. Uh, we'd load up with stuff in here. Uh, some of our guys, you know, you got your helmets, you bring flak vests, your backpack where you're carrying gear, food, water. Uh, that's probably a whole bunch of uh, uh, primer cord. Uh, just long strips here of explosive uh, that you use to set off multiple charges and things. Oh, and this kind of sitting around, you know, waiting to go. And you can see a lot of times, you know, the outfit here is very similar to what, you know, is in our little exhibit in the other room. Uh, basically, you know, your jungle fatigues here, which really got worn pretty fast. Uh, you know, a little jungle hat, which I kind of wore more times than not. Uh, you're not looking specially sharp and trim, you know. You <laughs> haven't washed in days. 
you know, and you're just kind of relaxing for a bit. No white gloves. No white, yeah, we didn't do any of that. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember, there's a platoon sergeant, and actually what he's holding in his hand, I think, is that. Because uh, we recovered that on one of our air assault things. And again, there's that little battery section here. That's the clicker, which basically is that in the, in the ground here was a buried 105 round. Uh, and that I think we actually recovered as part of an, an air assault. Uh, let's just, let me show you. Uh, let's see. Were those stolen men or just unexploded ones? Oh, well, just, well, you know, we fired millions of these rounds here. Uh, early on, probably 8% were duds. I mean, some of this stuff was left over probably from the Korean War and stuff. So they just bury themselves in the ground. And in many areas, you know, if it's like a rice paddy or soft area, it's conceivable it never would have triggered anyway. So there was no shortage of these around. And 155 rounds. Uh, in fact, Tom there, Tom commanded a, a, an 8 inch and a 15, oh, no, uh, it was bigger than that. 155 and 8 inch, or was it the 8 inch and 270? 8 inch and 270. Yeah, a battalion up along the DMZ. So they fired big stuff. Uh, yeah, let me skip. We'll, I can come back to this. But probably, well, let me show you just the Rome, what I mentioned, Rome plow. A major problem everywhere uh, the, was the fact that you know, roads going through a, a, any connecting major towns and stuff like that, basically a jungle on every side. Uh, and if your jungle comes right up within 50 yards of the road, you can get ambushed all the time. So a major part of the effort by engineers, other than us, was land clearing, creating broad stretches uh, from road, let's say there might have been a major road down through here, is you'd big dozers with special blades that would go on and just level everything. So you'd have almost 200 meters, uh, maybe a little less on either side, which gave you at least some protection. Was it Agent Orange part of it? Well, in other areas, Agent Orange was used. This Agent Orange, you wouldn't have used it along with, with uh, these, you know, Rome plow. Uh, but I think many of our engineers, certainly infantry, were exposed to Agent Orange in areas you went through. Uh, our mission typically was to go along with them and help them out with stuff, but we just didn't have the heavy equipment. Uh, they could even clear by going down a steep hill. Here are two D9 Rome plows here, and basically what you can't see is there's a cable going between the two. So one of them here goes straight down the hill, uses gravity to help do it while he clears, and then using the winch here and pulling on here, he pulls himself back up. Uh, yeah, this shows again kind of an area, and there actually is a road going through here. Uh, it looks awful, uh, but what we did discover kind of later on is if this was along a path where there was a village and stuff along the way, it actually helped the economy quite a bit. One, it made it safer and easier for the villagers to carry their goods to another market. It opened areas that then they could cultivate, uh, created lots of fallen timber and stuff that you know, the Vietnamese were able to use for all sorts of construction and stuff. Uh, but it was kind of jarring as you're flying over that area to see these big swaths. But most major highways, uh, we did a lot of that stuff on it. Uh, maybe just one more and then uh, we'll kind of end for any other questions. Uh, let's see. Let me talk about air assaults. Uh, we only actually participated in one major one, but you had a couple ways of operating there. You might do what you call the hammer and anvil type th operation. And we did this kind of in more the division, in which the enemy's kind of like here. You, you kind of figured that out. You would helicopter in 
a bunch of troops on the far side to kind of provide a barrier. And then you'd kind of come pushing in this way. Uh, and lo and behold, you're going to have a fight on your hands. Uh, another way is if you think you know there's a jungle base and things, you might just pop in on them. And the way you did that is with what we call the daisy cutter. This was a 10,000 pound bomb that was carried in a C-130, which kind of f flew over the area right where you want to land. And then you whoop, push that bomb out. It falls down and explodes at about a 50 foot elevation. And then engineers immediately helicopter in after that with infantry to expand the LZ. And then the rest of everybody comes in. Uh, and this was an operation we did. Uh, boom, there's the big boom. Uh, and it basically pulverizes a, a good amount of area, doesn't knock everything down. If you're underneath it, even underground in tunnels and stuff, uh, you pretty well are, are shocked, you know, at least for a period of time. Uh, How big an area was covered? Acre-wise? Uh, it blasts everything down, I would say, in the area between this building and the next. But you'd have a lot of tree stumps and stuff still sticking up. And that's what you have to knock down so helicopters can come in. Uh, and this was our second squad, second platoon. In fact, that was George's platoon, uh, kind of waiting to deploy. Uh, again, you can see uh, we're making good use of our, you know, our culprits. culprits. I don't know why, but I keep forgetting <laughs> that uh, and stuff. But we got basically loaded up with lots of C4, bunches of uh, uh, chainsaws, a lot of demolitions, uh, water and a lot of extra gasoline. That was kind of taking off from our base camp area. Uh, there's what the jungle, that's what the area looks like. That's pretty thick stuff. And you could have a whole regiment underneath there. And you probably wouldn't ever notice it. And that was kind of the challenge we had in here. Uh, again, this is flying into the same area. Uh, somehow or another, we'd gotten some intelligence that there was a base camp in this general area. We weren't certain if it was highly manned or just kind of, uh, you know, whatever. This is what the initial area looks like when you fly in. Just about enough room for maybe two helicopters. Even though it decimates stuff, look at the amount of standing stuff that's still there. Uh, and that's kind of another view. Uh, and again, amazing those helicopter pilots. <laughs> you know, you're flying into a, an area where at any moment, if one little bit in attention, your cup, your blade's going to catch one of these things, and it's all over. Uh, kind of landing, we immediately kind of race out. The infantry kind of spreads out. Uh, we l initially look around. If we see any tunnels, you immediately chuck in some demolitions into that. Uh, and then you just start working on the trees. Uh, there's another helicopter kind of coming in, you know. And then unloading guys real fast. Uh, and these helicopters, you're totally loaded with explosives, gasoline, uh, shot, you know, primer cord. I mean, one little round, and boy, you'd really go off. Uh, so then we immediately start the work. The, we spread out. Uh, anything that's taller than about this tall, you got to cut down. Uh, and lo and behold, there's one of our. Uh, rounds there, and that was tied to a, uh, uh, a trip wire. And again, you can see it's missing the uh, what we call the fuse. yeah the fuse part, which is always screwed onto it. So someone found that, took the you know fuse off, and plant and hooked it up to a uh, uh, not a good picture, but uh, one of the soldiers got shot and medevacking him out. Uh, kind of hard. Uh, there was a buried, another one of these things down there. Uh, okay, how to get rid of trees quickly? Uh, you use demolitions. You, uh, wood's kind of hard. Uh, use a lot of gasoline. So you basically run around uh, and you, on one side, this is C4, blocks of C4. 
with primer cord connecting them. So you have one on one side, and then up above, you put another. So what happens when it blows off? This pushes the tree in that direction. This pushes it in the other, and you basically snap it off. Uh, and again, this is what we call primer cord. It's uh, just pack C4 into it. Uh, it can be hundreds of yards if you want. You put a blasting cap on one end. When that goes, all of this goes. Uh, and bingo. You get, uh, that was kind of interesting. I kind of felt sorry. We stunned a kind of an eagle, some sort of raptor there. And the, the guys found it. Uh, I think it was dead. Well, anyway, that's what it looks like when you, uh, you know, blow the trees. Uh, there was a tunnel we found. And actually, I think that pistol, if I remember right, uh, we pulled out of the tunnel. In fact, I think this stuff came as part of that airborne assault we did. Uh, heating up some uh, chow there. And you can't really tell, but that's a block of C4 explosives. Uh, it's a military explosive, which is the best thing about it, it's quite stable. Uh, and it actually will burn. I, I wouldn't have encouraged them to do that. But, uh, uh, you know, it would kind of burn enough to heat up some food or stuff like that. Uh, Sergeant Dearborn, who is a platoon leader. And again, uh, we're fortunate. Most, I think almost all the squad leaders and platoon leaders uh, had prior assignments in Vietnam. They're older, certainly more mature. Uh, you can tell by his patch he was with the 101st before, sitting on a box of good old sea rations, which we ate. Uh, and just kind of some more work. Uh, that, that actually was a little battle position after George's position at night. Uh, you know, you, you don't have a lot of space, and it's hard to dig in that sort of environment. So just behind some logs, that's this PR-46 little radio, oh, Claymore mine, helmet, and other stuff. And you basically slept on the ground in, in a poncho or stuff. Huh? We found a, a viper, or the poisonous, there, and a large snail. Uh, just to resupply action. You know, once you're in an area like that, the only way to get resupply is through helicopters. Uh, this is a, called a Loach Light Observation Helicopter. Uh, spend a lot of time flying around in those. Uh, I don't know what that, other than just kind of the final wrap-up of this. Finally heading back to camp, kind of exhausted. Uh, again, rubber plantations. Oh, there's good old George and Sergeant Dearborn. Uh, and basically, that's kind of what we wore most of the time. Uh, you'd only wear the helmet, you know, if you went out on actual operation or stuff like this. Uh, but you can see, you wore this for a couple days at a time and stuff, and they got pretty raunchy. Uh, and you went through a bunch of them. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of it. I have some other slides, but we'll just leave it at that for now. Uh, can I ask, well, let me just, when I came back from there, uh, actually, Becky was in the Philippines when I was in uh, Vietnam. It turns out if you're a general officer, you're there for two-year assignments in Vietnam. And they were able to bring uh, their families to live at Clark Air Base. So Becky's mother was at Clark. Uh, she was pregnant at the time. Not a smart move on my, our part, my part there. But uh, she went and stayed with her mother. Uh, and actually, it was quite nice. I mean, here was a young wife there amongst all these general officer wives who kind of took her under her wing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and when I finally finished my assignment, I was cut TDY orders to go to the Philippines, since that's not an R&R &R place, uh, and to you know spend a little time with Beck. And then we finally came home. Uh, when I came back, you know, the country is a lot of turmoil and everything like that. And we all felt angry. At kind of what we thought was going on. Uh, but I fortunately was assigned to uh, what we call the Engineer Officer Advanced Course, uh, as I now was a captain. And that was to teach us how to be company commanders. But we'd already been one. So in a sense, it was kind of fun to you know, go through it all. 
but it was kind of a good time because a bunch of us, I mean, it was like a room like this. All of us had the same experience. Uh, half of us knew each other and stuff. And it just was a way to kind of get settled back down, get reacquainted with family and, and just kind of, you felt in a good environment. You could talk to people who understood what you'd been through. And the fact that we didn't feel guilty. You know, we didn't look upon ourselves as baby killers and all this kind of stuff. And we were trying to do the best job that we could uh, and help a country that was obviously going to be struggling uh, for quite a while. Uh, and then from there, you know, the thought was, well, what do we do next? Do I get out? Do I stay in? You know, and just fortunately for us, I always kind of had some offers for the next assignment. And Beck and I would kind of look at it and say, well, have we ever been there? You know, yeah, maybe we want to go there, you know. Uh, maybe uh, we'll do something, you know. And that kind of happened. So after that, I was fortunate enough, uh, actually, I kind of sold it. Uh, I'd always wanted to go back to West Point to teach at one point. But the only one who offered me something was the chemistry department. Yeah, I like chemistry, but not enough that I want to go back to graduate school in it. So one day while we were up here, I hoofed it up to West Point and knocked on the door of the physics department and said, hey, I'd like to come back and teach. Uh, and actually, it turns out they were having a big party uh, up at the head of the department head's quarters. He was a colonel. So actually, what happened is I knocked on their door at the party and said, you don't know me, but I'd like to come teach. And they just so happened to have an opening coming up. And since I had at that time a uh, Atomic Energy Commission fellowship, they wouldn't have to pay for me to go back to grad school. So, sure. So I kind of went back to teach there and thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, and then from there went to Germany back to an engineer battalion. Uh, and we figured, well, we haven't been to Germany. You know, let's go to Germany. And so I was busy all the time, but Beck and the kids and every, all the OYs always went out and did things. So that was fine. And then, you know, the next thing, oh, come back to uh, uh, a staff college, Joint Staff College in Norfolk. Hey, that was fun. And then it was kind of one thing led to another. You know, you start knowing people. And one guy who was also as an engineer knew me and the fact I had kind of a nuke background. He kind of put a word in for me to go to the Defense Nuclear Agency. Uh, okay, that sounded interesting. So we kind of did that. And then from there, uh, I also, someone knew me and said, oh, why don't you come back and teach nuclear engineering? But you got to go get a PhD to do that. So, okay. So it kind of, one thing led to another. And then finally, my last assignment with the Corps, again, with the background, is from West Point. Uh, the headquarters for the Corps of Engineers was looking for someone who had a new background, who supposedly was going to help them negotiate some stuff with Department of Energy to do cleanup. OK, I'm there. So I was brought down to negotiate with DOE. Uh, and then you know, the first Gulf War started, so we were part of military program, so we're scurrying around, managing the contracts to do the buildup in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, or Ku Saudi Arabia. You know, the thing we don't recognize now, war is different. In World War II and Korea, you want to move into an area, you just move in, you take it over. Well, nowadays, you don't go anywhere without having a contract. I mean, when we moved into Saudi Arabia, they offered us all sorts of stuff. but. You want to park your vehicles on a stand? You got to have a contract with the owner of that property. You want water? You got to have a contract to provide that. You want to get rid of trash? You need a contract. And this is the same stuff that we encountered eventually in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So a good part of the mission of the Corps, the other side of the Corps, civilian side, is to manage all of that. Uh, and uh, it's kind of complicated and costly. So anyway, uh, that was it. Uh, before we knew it, 25 years had gone by. Uh, and, uh, oh, yeah, let me just go back to one thing. 
I would say, uh, yeah, just to kind of finalize. Okay, what did I do? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, there are a few things that I did learn over time. Uh, first of all, command is great responsibility. Uh, I think it didn't hit me until, you know, that, that right after that uh, picture of me saluting with 130 guys behind me, you know, and realizing you're responsible, not only for them, but the mission and stuff. Uh, and I, I thought, that, you know, it really forced me to stop and think about a lot of things. I saw leadership, uh, marvelous examples of it. And I was very fortunate, I'd say, again, with West Point, I saw some mar great ones to model ourselves behind. Saw some bad stuff, too, later on, even as kind of cadets. You know, sometimes power goes to your head. Uh, but it's also how you implement it. Uh, one thing you do see in the Army a lot, and it's improved a little bit, is just the profanity. Uh, you know, a common, you know, sergeant and stuff back then, every other word would be, you know, something bad and stuff. And I found I just didn't do it. Uh, if I, but occasionally I would. And then they knew I was mad. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, again, I found you could do it, you know. And I enjoyed it. I just kind of enjoyed kind of leading groups of people. Uh, you got to know your job, and the men will know it very quickly. You got to be competent, uh, no matter what, whether you're a dozer operator or, or a company commander or a platoon leader. But you don't need to know everything. And, and I made sure, you know, that I was open for advice, you know, and particularly from platoon sergeants as you go out in the missions and stuff, because they've done it before. Uh, but ultimately, they needed to know I knew how to be a commander. And I knew how to do engineering and stuff like that. And I did. Uh, don't micromanage. The biggest frustration to me is I wanted to be out there. I wanted to be George. I really wanted to be out there with the guys, getting my hands dirty, you know, and doing all of that. But I had to let them do it. Now, I could step back and I kind of give advice and things like that. Uh, and occasionally I'd see they wouldn't do it the way I would have done it. You know, but you kind of have to let them do it as long as they're not going to get someone killed or whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, won't, I really wanted to be a platoon leader at that point. Uh, allow men to show pride in their skills. These guys are competent. And the dozer operators are proud. The, you know, the carpenters are proud. You know, the guys who do demolitions are proud. And, and I found any place that I could go, I'd engage them, I'd ask them how they're doing, and let them talk about it and stuff. And you really got to say, I'm very impressed with our young soldiers, even back then. Even the ones who were drafted, who couldn't wait to get out. Uh, they still were proud of the work that they were doing and were more than willing to share that. Uh, you got to look after your men, but again, ultimately you got to execute the mission. You know, men, if you give them an assignment, you're putting them in harm's way. Not the same way as infantry. I mean, those guys I just admire immensely. Uh, but, you know, every now and then you'd get grumbles. Of, why do we have to do that? You know, why do I have to be out there in advance of the infantry kind of coming here? You know, say, well, guys, that's our mission. And we're going to do it. And you pretty much could get there. Uh, I found developing good relations is up, down, and across are critical. Uh, one, because the core, well, one, that's your mission. If you can't get along with the people you're going to support or who you're going to ask for help with, they'll let you hang there. Uh, but if you, you know, got friends out there and they know you and things like that, uh, everyone's willing to help each other. And plus, the core is kind of a small group. You don't want to piss someone off because you're probably going to run into him two assignments later. <laughs> and he's going to be more senior or he's going to be assigned to your unit and stuff like that. So I just found it always was there. Be flexible, and that probably helped me as much when I retired, is you never did the same thing twice, it seemed. And every assignment was different. 
Uh, and that's what I kind of liked. Uh, when I finally retired, I joined a, a great environmental engineering firm called MWH. But I found guys in there who'd been doing exactly the same thing for 15 years. And granted, they were really experts at it. But to me, God, I couldn't imagine doing that. Uh, and to me, yeah, every, I could, every 18 months to a year, two years, I'd be moved somewhere different. I'd be in a completely different job. Uh, and I have to learn pretty darn fast how to fit in and, and what to do. And that I kind of liked. Uh, and then just kind of the last there, I found, you know, with any mission we kind of did, and even when I later on in civilian life, you know, being able to explain the why behind what you're wanting to do was important. Whether or not it necessarily makes sense, you know, strategically or whatever, uh, we all like to kind of know why and how we fit into that thing and being willing to listen, you know, and let people grumble and stuff like that. But uh, all of this, I think, just made me a better person. And, you know, just finally, would I do it again? I probably would. Uh, and, <laughs> and that's my older son, who I'm very proud of. Uh, and he's in, you know, he's now in for 20 years. And he didn't think he would be in that long either. Uh, but anyway, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, um, if I can answer any other final questions, I know it probably went a little longer here. Uh, but it was a fun career, challenging and enjoyable. So thank you. So anyway, if you want to look at any of this, uh, we have it here. In fact, this was my company roster lists everyone on it and things so.